Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name again, like I said, is uh, Rose Keen, Communication Specialist with the Soybean Innovation Lab. And thank you for joining us this morning for our Pan-African Soybean Variety Trial uh, Data Analysis Webinar based off of the results in Malawi. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Brian Deers, Professor of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois and still researcher. We also have with us uh, Michelle Fonseca Santos, a postdoc with the Department of Crop Sciences. And today, Brian will be speaking with you about the results from Malawi of the Pan-African Trials. Just a quick summary, the Soybean Innovation Lab has partnered with the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture, the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, and the African Agricultural Technology Foundation and other partners to implement the first third-party testing of soybean in Sub-Saharan Africa. This Pan-African Soybean Variety Trial Program fast-tracks the introduction and testing of commercial soybean varieties in order to provide local seed companies and farmers access to a broader selection of seed than is currently available. And again, like I said, Dr. Brian Deers will be speaking today about the results from the Malawi feed trials. So just to take care of a couple of housekeeping items before we go ahead and get started, if throughout the webinar you have any questions that you would like to ask, please, please feel free to use the chat box on the lower right-hand side of your control panel. You can see that there, it's a chat bin, and you can use the arrow to toggle down and ask any questions you would like. We will make sure those get answered for you. Uh, additionally, there is a handout, which you can see on your control panel, which is the slides from today's webinar. And finally, all of these items will be available online after the webinar, as well as all the answers to the questions that get asked. So once again, thank you for joining us, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Dears at this point. Okay, so thank you, Rose. Um, yeah, so this is Brian Deers. I'm a professor in the Crop Sciences Department at the University of Illinois. And so what I'm going to be doing today is talking about the, the Malawi field trials and some of the results of the trials from the analysis we've uh, conducted so far. So what I plan to do is first uh, go through an overview of the cropping season and the testing environments, talk about the different environments where the tests were grown, talk a little bit about how, how the trials did in these different environments. Then I'll talk about the results from the analysis, um, talk about yield and other traits that were where we've collected data. Then what I'll do is I'll talk about some, some of the meaning of the results. You know, what, what can we um, learn from the results from these tests? Then I'll talk about the trials and hopefully we can have some discussion about the results from the trials and how we can improve the trials because we, we certainly want to do, we, we want to improve the trials over time so we can get better data. And then finally I'll, I'll open it up for some discussion about next steps in, in this trialing process. So um, on this slide, we've got a map showing the locations of the trial. So I think one of the strengths of this trialing program that we had in Malawi this past growing season is that we had tests in many environments. Um, and this, we were able to do this because of collaborations among different groups. So we had um, uh, work done in the in the public sector from DARS and IITA, they grew four trial locations. And then we also had private sector um, uh, participates, participation. So Alliance One grew tests at two environments, Exagris grew tests at two environments, and Limby Leaf grew uh, a test at one environment. And by having these cooperators, especially in private industry, I think that's really given a lot of strength to this testing program and has allowed us to get wide testing of varieties across Malawi. So what I'm going to do is just go through the different test sites, north to south, and just give some basic information about these test sites um, that I think will help us with, with um, understanding the results from the analysis. So I'll apologize to begin with that I'm probably going to mispronounce some of these locations. Um, but um, to, to start with, the, the first environment, the furthest north is Baca. Uh, so this is a DARS ITA site, and we can see a photo of the, the site shortly after emergence. It's a lower elevation site, so the, the elevation there is 469 meters. 
it was sown February 1st, harvested June 1st, and this location had um, had the lowest average yield of the locations that we got good yield data from. So the average yield at this environment was 1.1 tons per hectare. The next location um, headed, heading south is Nicoso, um, and this is an ex agris location. Uh, it's higher elevation, so over 1,100 meters. It was sown uh, December 21st, harvested May 25th. Uh, average yield there was 1.8 tons per hectare. Uh, the next environment is Chilonga. Um, uh, this was an environment grown by Alliance One. Elevation was 972 meters. It was sown December 21st, harvested May 25th. Average yield was 1.8 tons per hectare. This was also a site of one of the field days. So this was one of the locations I actually visited when I was there to for the field days. And it, when I looked at it, it looked it looked quite good. Um, and you can see the photo here shows um, um, people at the field day looking at the plots. Uh, the next environment is New Tuthama. Uh, this environment was grown by Limby Leaf. Um, elevation was uh, 1,078 meters. It was sown January 25th, harvested May 11th. Average yield there was 1.6 tons per hectare. Uh, the next environment was Mampala. Um, this was an Alliance One environment. Elevation was over 1,100 meters. Sown January 11th, harvested May 15th. This environment had the distinction of having the highest average yield. So the average yield was 2.9 tons per hectare. And we actually had genotypes or, or varieties at this location that yielded over four tons per hectare. So I'm hoping that we're going to learn learn from this environment to see what was actually done to result in these high yields there. The next environment is Chitala. Uh, this was a DARS IETA site. Elevation was 606 meters. It was sown December 19th. Harvested May 29th. Average yield was 1.2 uh, tons per hectare. The next environment is Salima. Uh, that's an extra agris site. Elevation was 550 meters. It was sown January 19th. It wasn't harvested because there was poor emergence or poor plant emergence. So we, the, the site had to be abandoned because there just wasn't good enough stands. Uh, next environment is Chitezi. Uh, that's a DARS ITA site, elevation 1,097 meters. It was sown December 18th, harvested May 9th. Average yield was 1.9 tons per hectare. And this this is at the main um, experiment site for, for DARS as well as ITA works out at that site. And there was a field day at that location as well. And, and when I visited that location, the plots looked looked very very good. Okay. And the next location is Bavimbui, and that's another DARS ITA location. Elevation 1,159 meters. That was sown January 11th, harvested May 24th. Data was not used in the final analysis, at least for yield, because there was so much variability because of rust infestation. So we weren't able to use the, the yield data from that, in, that location. So we had nine total locations, and we had data from seven of the locations that were used in the analysis. So I'd like to give a chance for people who um, grew some of these environments uh, to talk about some of the locations and, and comment on them. So I know Godfrey and McDonald are on. So 
if if um, one of you wants wants to talk, uh, I'd, I'll you can have an opportunity to talk about the environment. Sure. Have a gun thing. Or same. Hello, Brian. Hello, hi. Is this guy? Hi, I'm McDonald. Hey, hi, McDonald. Yeah, I just wanted to give a summary of those environments uh, managed by the partners like uh, Alliance One, Limbe Reef, and Exagris. Sorry, can you repeat? I'm saying uh, I wanted to give a summary in terms of rainfall, uh, yeah, rainfall data for those environments in, uh, managed by our partners like uh, Alliance One and uh, Limbe Reef. Okay. Yeah, because Forest will give a, a summary for DAS sites. Like, okay. Uh, yeah. So with me here is uh, the rainfall data for the season. Of course, I, I just summarized it to, into totals, not 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 the actual distribution for every month. Here, I'll I'll go up to the, let's say the map where we have them all. Okay. Yeah, of course, for the rainfall, I can just give. Uh, I'll just give the the, the, the this total sum for all the eight environments that we used in the analysis, starting from back up to. Uh, eight. Okay. Yeah, for back uh, the total rainfall was side one, right? Was what? Baka, which is site one. Yeah. The total rainfall was uh, one thousand three hundred and forty-six point eight millimeters. Okay. Yeah. While for uh, site two, which is Chitedze. Yeah. Yeah. The total rainfall for the season is nine hundred and twenty-nine point eight millimeters. And site three, which is Chitara, the total rainfall is 235.1 millimeters. Site four, which is Vumbwe, the one which uh, the data wasn't used because of so much variation, the total rainfall is 975.2 millimeters. Site five, uh, it's uh, is it Mpale in uh, Doha? The total rainfall was 812 millimeters. Site six, can you hear me? Brian. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can uh, hear you, okay. McDonald. All right, site six, uh, the total rainfall is 835 millimeters. Chilanga. Yeah, site six is Chilanga. Okay. And uh, site seven, which is in Tundama, it's uh, 165.7 millimeters. Finally, site eight is uh, 653.1 millimeters. And what location is that? Site eight is uh, Rumpi, in Hozo, in Rumpi. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, can I give just a brief uh, distribution as well? Sure. Okay. Just hold on. Are you there, McDonald? Yeah. I've accessed the, the, the document and now I will have to give a, the distribution. So starting with site one, which is the Baka. Uh, as I've already said, it was 1,346.8, but uh, it was 
poorly distributed, distributed in, uh, in such a way that most of the rain came in April. Okay. From uh, November, the total for November it was 93.9. Well, for December, the total was uh, 206.3. And in, 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 in January, it was uh, 268.2, while February, it was 92.2. In, in, in uh, March, it was 347. In April, it was 317. But uh, surprisingly, in April, uh, there were uh, 11 consecutive days of rainfall. So you can see that the distribution wasn't good enough. Yeah. 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 Just to uh, to comment on what McDonald uh, said on the the backer side during the period, the technician report, uh, reported that most of the varieties they were waterlogged due to heavy rainfall. Okay. Yeah. And so that, that that would be one explanation for the lower yields up there. Yeah. Yes, that's for site one, which is bagger. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in May it was just uh, there was just one rainy day. Yeah, uh, the, okay. the amount was twenty one point seven. Okay. And I go to site two. Sure. Okay, site two. So just mention the highest. Okay, uh, inside two, I will just uh, mention the, the 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 lowest month of rain and the highest as well, because in the I think because of the time. Okay. Yeah, inside two because the, the trial was planted on uh, 18th December. Is it 18th December? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So the highest uh, month of rain it was it was. Uh, December, which was uh, 281.6. And uh, we had uh, nine consecutive days of rainfall. That is from 13th to 21st December to 169.5 millimeters during this period only. Okay. And if, and the lowest uh, 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 month for rainfall is January, because we uh, during this it is during this period where we had prolonged dry spell from January to February. So the okay. total for the total for January was fifty two point two millimeters, and uh, we only had uh, how many rainy days? I think uh, we. I think it should be 11 rainy days, if I'm not mistaken. Just for the yeah. month of January. Yeah. And from February, it had normalized up to end of the season. Yeah. So, of course, germination wasn't much affected at Chitez compared to other sites, of course. But uh, for site three, which is Chitara? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, Chitara is uh, a low altitude area again, and uh, it is generally characterized as a low rainfall area as well. So in December, from November to December, there was completely no rainfall. Uh, it, well, it's in January, the total rainfall was just 29 millimeters, and uh, they were less. Than, it was it rained in less than uh, 10, 10 days for the total. Okay. Uh, yeah. Whilst there, uh, in February, that, that's when they experienced the much of the rainfall, amounting to 160, 69.2, and it only occurred in less than. Uh, six days so you can see that the distribution wasn't good yeah yeah and the germination was really affected because soon after planting we had about uh, almost six weeks right of dry spell but the yeah. uh, 
but I it is, uh, at least it survived. Yeah. Mm. Yes. And uh, for site four, which is Vumbwe, site four, uh, they didn't give us the distribution, uh, the rainfall distribution. They just gave us a summary, the total sum for the for the for the for the for the month and for the season. So I'll just quickly go to site site five, which is uh, Mpari in Doha. Okay. Yeah, site five. Uh, the lowest rainfall month was uh, April. Of course, I understand by this time most of the entries had, had, had attained physiological maturity, so they might not have uh, had any significant uh, impact on yield. But the highest rainfall month was in February, which was uh, 216. Uh, Point, 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 216.0 millimeters. And uh, I remember during the time we had visited, the, the, the farm manager there, Den, Mr. Dennis, he lamented that they had received uh, 119 millimeters in three days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, it had an impact uh, overall on some of the entries. Yeah, and just to add, uh, we, uh, the technician also highlighted that during the dry, they they had a dry spell like for three weeks. Three weeks. But during that time, they irrigated the crops. Okay. Yeah. Now for site six, which is Jiranga, uh, the highest rain for month was December. They had received two hundred and forty-one millimeters and uh, in Chiranga they planted on 21st December so overall it was we can say it was evenly distributed throughout the month of December so there wasn't much negative impact and uh, the lowest trend for month was April and by this period even during the time we were conducting the field day most of the area maturing entries had already attained Physiological maturity, so they were they were not affected much with this low rainfall in April. Okay. Yes, and uh, site seven, which is a uh, the one managed by uh, Limbe Reef. Uh, it was planted again in uh, it was it it was in January because because of the dry spells in December. It, it, it was planted, uh, I think, yeah, for the five, for the for the last time in this, in January. And, uh, the time they were receiving a lot of rain for was uh, in December, 136 mm. But by this time, they had not received the seed yet, so it had no impact. But okay. yeah, so overall, here the rain for distribution wasn't quite impressive because uh, like during the month of February, most of the days were dry days. And uh, when it, uh, the days that they had received rainfall, uh, they can be summed up to maybe less than 15, but it, uh, when, it, when it rains, it used to rain consecutively for maybe a, for five days, so you can see that with such distribution, it would have a, a, a serious impact. Like uh, this, uh, looking at this data from seventh to eleventh February, it had rained consecutively, amounting to one hundred and three point six millimeters, and and uh, from um, 25th to 28th, it had also rained consecutively amounting to 30.9 uh, millimeters. So the total for the, for the month of February was 146 millimeters, but it, was, it wasn't even a period, so it, it had a negative impacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, uh, just to sum it all. In the site eight, which is the uh, room here, In Rumpi, uh, the highest rainfall month was December again. 
it has to 276.7. And again, not even redistributed from 15th to, to 29th. It had drained consecutively every single day from 15th up to 29th, amounting to 260 millimeters. And the lowest trend for Mark was April. And by this period, uh, most of them had, most of the area maturing lines had, had already attained physiological maturity. So no significant impact yet. <laughs> and uh, maybe Forrest can, can, can add something. I just to add, uh, at this site, when we visited with McDonald, uh, the first visit, most of the crops were, were scorched due to dry spell. And then after they received this uh, heavy landfall, uh, the technician also reported that most of the, the, the varieties were heavily affected with the heavy downpour. So it also has, uh, contributed to the low use to this site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I can say. Yeah, thank you. That's the summer uh, on the landfall for all sides. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other any other general comments of uh, what you saw at the different sites? So for example, the Mpali that had the highest yield, what, any observations from that location? Yeah, uh, I was discuss actually I was discussing with McDonald on the, after seeing the results. Uh, we noted that during the dry spell, because almost, uh, the whole country had uh, experienced the dry spell, but this time they did not like actually experience it because during the, that period they were irrigating it. Whilst okay. other sites like, like Chitete, Baka, or in other sites, uh, when we visited, they said they did not irrigate, so they had to wait for the next lane for. But this side they were soon after they observed that there is dry spell, they were irrigating it. So I think that can also contribute to to the to the high yield yeah definitely. it's like the crops were not affected at all like with the dry spell okay so um yeah we i we, we trained the technician during the training with mcdonald uh soon after the training at, at, at during the harvest time we not we were we received a report that this technician uh got fired so he had to hand over to a new technician, of which we did not train that technician. So we we're also thinking that maybe <laughs> it can also contribute to low yields because the, that person wasn't trained, but he was the one who was like collecting the harvest data. So sometimes these technicians can uh, manipulate the results and the like, but all in all, I think it may be the, 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 the greatest contribution is the irrigated one. Yeah, yeah. About the, the, like, the proper way of collecting the data, like after we, we, after we discussed with him, he said, I know uh, we have been, I've been training him and then he, I'm 100% sure that he will give the good results on the data collection and the like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think he, it was all, Corrected, I think perfect, right? But maybe the only contribution will be the irrigation one. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Probably. and it was well managed. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I, I, I'm going to move on now and just talk about the data. And at the end, we can have some time to talk about talk about the results again. Um, so anyway, this this next table lists the varieties that were tested. So we had 36 total varieties from seven different sources, including the private companies as well as the public sector. Initially, we had all the varieties coded, but we came back and asked the contributors of the varieties whether or not we could provide the names of the varieties, and everyone agreed except one of the contributors. So we're now we're able to provide all the variety names except for a couple. This just lists the, the trait variation for the varieties across environments. So if we look at yield, the average yield across all the environments was 1,752 kilograms per hectare, 
when we looked at individual varieties over environments, the highest variety yield was 2,400 kilograms per hectare, lowest was 686. Maturities, the average was 113 days, range from 120 to uh, 106. Seed weight, average was 15, 20 to uh, 12.7, that's in grams per 100 seed. And the lodging, the average lodging was 2.2. This is on a scale of one to five, where one, the plants are completely erect, five, they're completely down on the ground. And that ranged from 2.5 to 1.3. Great, and thank you. Just to uh, remind everybody of a couple of housekeeping items. This is Rosemary Keen again. Uh, in our handouts section, we have a report from the results, and we also have the webinar slides. And if you have any questions for Brian or for any of the other speakers, please feel free to type them in the chat box on the bottom right-hand side. Thank you. Okay, so this next table lists the yields in kilograms per hectare, the maturity, the seed weight, and the lodging of the different varieties across the seven environments where we had good data that went into the analysis. So what you can see, as, as I mentioned before, the highest yielding was over 2,400 kilograms per hectare. Lowest was down to 686 kilograms per hectare. I mean, what I, I think is good to see is that we've got high yielding varieties from various sources. So it suggests that there's a lot of, you know, opportunities out there for new varieties for, for growers. Um, this, this table has a lot of data. So what I just, what I, or what I did was I'll point out a few different things. So in the next slide, I'm just showing that the lowest yielding lines were all from uh, Sari in Ghana. So that's a Savannah Agricultural Research Institute. So they were they were selected in Ghana. And what you can see is that I think, you know, we had low yields of these varieties, which indicates that these varieties coming out of Ghana just are not very well adapted to Malawi. Um, not to say that these aren't good varieties in Ghana, they're, they're good varieties there, but they just don't adapt very well um, to Malawi. So that's one thing that we observed from the data. This next slide, I'm just showing the highest 15 uh, lines and just like to point out that they're from various sources. So you can see they're from DARS, they're from Seedco, IITA, and Makerere University. So again, that shows that we've actually got a good, you know, lots of sources of good varieties. The highest yielding variety is a TGX line, which is a DARS line that was developed by IITA. Next, next highest yielding variety is from, C, from Seedco. We have other lines from DARS, Seedco, Makerere, IITA. So again, we've got a good range of varieties. This highest yielding line, this T, TGX, uh, 1991 22F. Interesting thing about that is it's actually got pretty early maturity, which I think is a could be a good thing, especially for drought drought prone environments that you can get this variety mature before you run out of water. Um, another another thing is that th we had a lot of variation in this test for how well we could determine yields or or we don't have very precise estimates of yield. So our LSD or our least significant difference was over 500 kilograms per hectare. So what that tells us is that, you know, basically the first nine varieties, we can't say that any of these are significantly different statistically. So they're all basically in, this, in the same group and we can't say statistically one's better than the other. So we had really diverse environments. So one of the things is we need to consider is that, that some varieties are going to do better in some environments than other environments just because of adaptation issues. So what this figure or this table shows is yields for the set across all the sites in the first column and then for each of the seven environments. And what I've done is I've color coded it or shaded it so that the darker the blue, the higher the yield to help you be able to 
pick out which ones are the, the highest yielding. Um, so anyway, what you can see is again, these, these sorry lines down on the bottom are all shaded red. L lower yields would be more red, darker blue, higher yields. So what you can see is the sorry lines are down on the bottom with pretty low yields at most environments. Whereas these highest yielding lines, you can see that they performed well at most of the environments. So again, I'll just summarize this table by looking at just the high, the 15 highest yielding lines. Um, so what you can see is that, you know, the, the highest yielding lines generally did well in, in most environments, although there are there is variation. Like for example, this the Seco line. S10 9s or 79-6-7 that had the highest yield of any variety and that was in Mimpala. Um, but you can see it wasn't the highest yielding line in all environments and especially in Baca it was a very low yielding line. So again it shows that there's some differences in, a, in adaptation in these environments. Another thing to consider too is we have a lot of error variants for these different tests. So you, you can't, you, we can't just say if one is numerically higher yielding than the other, that it's actually significantly higher yielding. So again, because of the high LSDs, a lot of these varieties are not significantly different from each other. Let's see. So. You know, so one of the things I mentioned was that there is there are differences in adaptation of varieties, and that's something we need to consider. And there's different ways to look at this adaptation. And one way to do this is what's called a biplot analysis. And basically what you do is you look at the genotype by environment interaction and you you're, you analyze that interaction and you can plot it out. And what you can do is you can separate out your different environments to look at these different environments to see if some of these environments are more similar than others, which can help you basically identify what are called macro environments that allows you to identify varieties that perform well. And then you can identify varieties that perform well in these macro environments. And so what I'm showing in this, in this uh, slide is this this biplot analysis and what you can see are basically plots of where these different environments come out so what the how you interpret this is that if the line that designates an environment if these lines the angles of the lines are similar that would mean that these environments are similar so for example baka and chitala they're fairly simple, similar angle. That suggests that varieties perform similar in the, these two environments. Um, we also then have the numbers for the entry number for the different uh, varieties. And how you can interpret this is that, for example, let's say in Baca, um, variety number, entry number one did well in Baca because it's the one is close to where the Baca location is located. So again, this helps us understand kind of how these environments are performing and are variety, varieties performing similarly in these different groups of environments. When you do this kind of analysis, a good thing to do is actually then actually look to see whether or not these groupings make sense. And what I did was I went through to see if that was in fact the case. So I already mentioned, so Baca and Chitala came out clustered together. If we actually look at these two environments, they're geographically fairly far separated north to south, but they're, they're the two environments we had yield data that had the lowest elevation, which suggests that you know these two are grouping together because they're both lower elevation, warmer environments, and similar environments are doing well in these environments. Same we're seeing here is with this Nituthama and Chilonga. You can see these two environments group closely together. And again, 
geographically they're close to each other, which makes sense. Uh, Chitezi and Mapala, these the lines are at a similar angle, so it suggests that they're grouping together. Again, these two environments are geographically close to each other. Nepali is the line is much further out than with Chitezi, and that suggests that there's a little more uniqueness in this Nepali environment. And again, that's probably because we had such high yields at that location. And as Florence said, we have the irrigation there, which caused probably gives us a kind of a unique environment there. And then finally, we have this roofy environment, which this is clustering very, very differently from all the other environments. So it suggests, again, this is somewhat of a unique environment, and the varieties are, are performing uniquely there. Okay, so with that, I'd like to bring up some, some discussion um, questions or, or comments that I think we hopefully will have some time to talk about. So one, one follow-up is that we still need to collect protein and oil results to add to the report. So we're going to have that those analyses done in Malawi at Sun Seeds, but we were having problems with their machine that analyzes protein and oil. So we're now in the process of getting the seed shipped to, to the U.S. so we can do the analysis there. Um, another thing is that as I, I've talked about already, is we have high LSDs for all these tests. I mean, one of the things we need to think about is what are ways we can we can tighten up some of this variation in the test so that we can get more accurate results and, and do a better job of making selections. Next thing is this Mampali environment where we have the highest yield, you know, what practices were applied at Nepali that could be applied to other locations. I guess I already, we found out from Florence that probably a lot of that had to do with the irrigation at that site and that, you know, in many, that that's not something that can be all that widely applied because you have to have that ability to, to apply the irrigation. Um, also, I talked about these macro environments, and what we need to do is actually go back and verify the yields of varieties in additional seasons to really verify those yields and also verify these macro environment um, 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 clustering. And then the final thing is, what would be the best way to provide the results to, to growers and other people in the industry so that these results can be, can, can be used by others? Um, and I'd finally like to just acknowledge that we had lots of people to grow these tests. I'm talking about the results, but I did really none of the work. Um, so we have to acknowledge Alliance One, X-ray Egress, Limbo Leaf, DARS, ITA, who grew these tests. We need to also give a acknowledge Godfrey, McDonald, and Cristobal, who work very very hard and diligently to organize these tests and make sure seed was was, was distributed and then we also need to 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 uh, acknowledge the contributors of, of funding for this these tests so with that i'm hoping we've got some time for for some discussion great thank you so much uh dr Deers. and at this point i'd like to turn it over to dr peter goldsmith who is the director of the soybean innovation lab he will lead our question and answers this morning. Yeah, thank you, Rose. Uh, welcome, everyone. Yeah, we have a, a question uh, from uh, Dr. Abubakar, who said, um, uh, first complimenting the, the webinar, I thought it was great, um, but he wanted to understand better about the Mapale site, uh, and, uh, and maybe that would also uh, for um, McDonald uh, and, and Florence to talk about that maybe, but uh, what are the main differences between this site and the others? Because uh, there was um, such good performance there. So McDonald um, and Florence, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, as previously, oh, thanks for the question, first of all. Uh, as previously uh, discussed by uh, Floris and myself, this site in Pali, uh, despite receiving an, an equal distribution of rainfall, it, uh, it, it registered high yields overall. 
And uh, the major reason is that which uh, Floris explained that uh, they had backup uh, uh, remedies, like uh, they were irrigating uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, low or, or no rainfall at all. So th that's one of the major contributing factors to, to registering higher yields compared to all other sites. But also maybe uh, I was thinking on the, the soil status. I think that plus if, uh, for those of you who were there during the field day, maybe you noted that it was fallow. I think it, it wasn't used for quite a long time. So they just opened that place for the for the trial site because those those guys they have like a lot of space so normally when they they have maybe something new they have to open up like a, a a new land for the for the for that activity so maybe because it was fallow and then he, i don't know if you are still keeping the soil results maybe if we get the the soil results will also back up the results in case the soil is very rich compared to the other sites and good management as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from Alliance One on the webinar who could also comment. Uh, other questions? Uh, obviously, uh, the, the major effect was uh, the irrigation. Uh, because if you irrigate the soybean, they definitely get better yields. So irrigation was yeah. actually the main. Uh, you see the difference uh, like here in Zambia, the commercial farmers, their yields are as good as they, I mean, three three tons per hectare. But the smaller farmers still get about uh, less than a ton. It's due mainly because of supplementary irrigation. Mm -hmm. So you... So at all these sites without irrigation, there was drought at some some point during the growing season that would have limited yield. Is is the you know the distribution McDonald talked about? You see yeah. the red distribution is very I mean uh, so it's, it's not even. So yeah. you may get rainfall at the start of a growing season, uh, or you may get it at a very late stage. Uh, if you get it at a very late stage, soybean normally doesn't recover well. But if you get um, good rainfall before it flowers, so normally it recovers. But obviously, the yield will be reduced uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the plants will not grow as tall as you'd want. And uh, there will be a lot of uh, abortion. So drought is actually the main uh, factor in terms of yield reduction. Uh, and also the site, surprisingly, uh, also didn't have a, a lot of uh, rust. Uh, on the results, I, 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 the results I saw, the rust scores were on the lower side to what I expected, but uh, at that side there, there was actually the rust was not there at that side. Okay. So at the Buvwembe site where you had a lot of rust, so th you were not able to score rust there. I didn't, I didn't see any rust data. So is that, I guess that's a question for Godfrey and McDonald and Florence. I, I don't think this code, the, the, rust, the rust data uh, at Google site was, uh, they did partial scores for that, but they did score everything. So we couldn't, we couldn't use it. But okay. it, uh, it supports the, the rust data. And therefore, uh, for the analysis I did, I only used it as a, as a site which calculates I mean, rust scores. Was all the other side? I don't think the people uh, were able to score uh, yeah. the rust. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, it's good that there wasn't a huge rust outbreak that limited yield at other sites. Other questions? Yeah. Hey, this is Pete Goldsmith. Uh, hey, Brian. Yeah, I had a couple of. Uh, well, I, maybe, yeah, a couple other questions. One, um, was there any ability to go back on the Bavumbe site uh, and look at some of the Makareri rust resistance or the Seedco rust resistance to see if they performed any differently or were able to handle that environment any better? Um, 
then maybe we'll we can do that to ex a little bit to explore the rust issue. Yeah, I mean we we could we didn't use the yield data because it was just highly variable and and it just we we felt that it it would be hard to to use that data and it may may mess up just our overall means. But yeah, that's a good idea. We can go back and see what what actually was able to perform well there. Yeah, and um, the uh, McDonald and, and Florence and Godfrey described really well the the environment of the inconsistent rains and the heavy rains and so forth. And I wondered if they could describe the uh, tillage practice for planting. Was there ridging? Did that help? Did that hurt? Was it done? Is there anything that can be done to uh, to help us? And if there is, uh, you know, the heavy, you know, 200 millimeter rains right at uh, right at planting. Uh, Dr. Pida. No. Yep. Yep. I hear you. Uh, may you rephrase the question, please? Yeah, I was wondering just if you could describe for all of us the the tillage practice for for planting for uh, seed bed prep in terms of was because you described really well the intense rainfall at planting um, and uh, uh, effect it had on emergence. Uh, and I wonder whether there was ridging or did you do anything where they, what was the prescription in terms of seed bed prep? Yeah, all right. Uh, for all dust sites, we we used the, we didn't make the ridges, we just used on a flat. Was from Pale, they, they made uh, ridges. The, the entrance were planted on the ridges. Pompale site and um, Chilanga as well. On that site, we did not make leeches. And do, what's your thought? Is that something that's uh, critical to do or not do? Is that something that would be in the protocol or what, what are your thoughts I, on that prep? Yeah, we, we thought maybe if we make it uniform, like to say if we are making leeches, all sites should have the ridges on it. And then if it's flat, then in the protocol, it should indicate that all, all trial sites should, should have flat, because maybe that can also contribute to the variations in the yield. Yeah, I mean, the, the important thing is to have consistency within environment. So, you know, it's not going to hurt your LSD if one environment does, uses ridges, another environment doesn't. The problem is if half an experiment is ridged, the other half is not. That could cause problems. Mm -hmm. So one, I guess a question for Florence and Godfrey is, so the, the line or the variety that yielded the best was it the, I, the IATA line. What's the, um, what's the plan for that? Are you, planning to release it, this TGX 1991-22F, is that being yeah, released? I mean, this, these lines were handed over to DAS for, for release for on-farm trials so that they can actually release them. So it's actually up to DAS now to use uh, this data and also the data from the uh, uh, the on-farm trials. Uh, this, there are two varieties there. Uh, the TGX uh, 1987 uh, 62F and also the 1991 uh, 22F. Uh, we handed them over to DAS for them to, to release. The, actually, the, the, the other one, 1988.18F. Uh, but uh, the major problem with them at that time, when I joined the IITA, they were not very uniform, so we had to reclean them. Now they're clean, they can actually uh, I release them if they, they they want to, and we can also use data from from trials to support the release of these varieties. Okay. The only 
only challenge uh, when I talk to also the people who want to use these varieties, they, they, they are quite similar to Ticolori. That's probably one of the, the things. And then they thought maybe it might confuse the farmers in terms of uh, uh, they're not very distinct from Ticolori. So we were trying to look for varieties which are actually very distinct from Ticolori. I mean, it, to me, it looks like it, it like in 1991, it, it has a yield benefit across most environments relative to Ticolori. Um, yeah. So even if it's not obviously distinct, it still looks like it'd be something worth releasing and getting getting into the hands of farmers. Yes, it's uh, it's actually in the hands of Florence now to go ahead and release it, and uh, we're waiting for dust to release them. That's why yeah. they actually the dust uh, 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 um, source. Okay, good. Yeah, um, each and every year we normally have the dust annual review meeting where you you present your results. So I'm expecting to present these results from the Pan African trials. And then I'll propose these um, uh, uh, lines for release. And then I'm um, I'm sure some of you you be there you'll be required to be there so that we can help one another to give the comments. Um, I think I'll I'll give you the invitation uh, soon after they they they, they set up the, the dates for the for the annual review meetings. But we are planning to propose for release during that forum because that's the only forum where we 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 propose for release. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I think if there are no more questions, um, we'd like to once again thank Dr. Dears and our collaborators for taking the time today to share us with us the data from the trials in Malawi. Um, and once again, all these materials will be available online, the recording, the questions and answers, and the two handouts. Uh, and if you need any more information about this project, please feel free to visit our website at soybeaninnovationlab.illinois.edu. And you can find all our contact information on there as well, including information for upcoming webinars. So once again, thank you very much for joining us, and we hope to see you at our events in the future.